Knight was a skinhead at 14 and a neo-Nazi leader by the time he was 16. He now devotes his life to helping people leave extremist groups. Please welcome Christian Picciolini. <laughs> I enjoy saying your last name. Picciolini. Like a peach. Picciolini. Like a peach. You're like a peach. Aww. Okay, let's get into this. Uh, you've said that um, we have a homegrown terrorism epidemic in this country. Can you explain that? Yeah. Uh, since 9-11, more Americans have been killed on U.S. soil by white supremacists than by any other foreign or domestic terrorist group combined. Yet we still don't call it terrorism. We, we call it, you know, fluffy words like white nationalism or the alt-right. Those are words that they've given themselves, by the way. Let's just call it what it is. It's white supremacy and it's white terrorism. Yes. Sorry. I don't usually start applause breaks, but that's so true. It's their, I think you said this, they, they rebrand themselves, and that's they dangerous. Do. It yeah. is what it is. And actually, we started that process 30 years ago. We recognized we were turning away even average American white racists. Shaved heads and the swastikas were apparently too much for them. And we said, we need to look like them, we need to sound like them, and we need to be where they are. So we traded in our boots for suits. We went to college campuses, recruited there. Uh, got jobs in law enforcement, went to the military, and here we are 30 years later, and, uh, you know, they look like Brooks Brothers. That should not be a campaign for Brooks Brothers, but <laughs> it did cross my mind. Um, how does one become a, a skinhead at 14? Uh, asking for a friend. Asking for a friend. <laughs> I, don't, I don't do those referrals anymore. <laughs> You know, I was a lonely kid. I came from a good family, but my parents uh, are immigrants who came from Italy and they worked really hard. And I was lonely and felt abandoned growing up. And one day, when I was 14, I was standing in an alley smoking a joint. That is not the gateway drug to white supremacy, it let me just say no, that. No, this is not against weed, because no. weed is also the drug of um, peace. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> But America's first neo-Nazi skinhead leader walked up to me, he snatched a joint from my mouth, and he said, that's what the Jews and the communists want you to do to keep you docile. I was 14, I didn't even know what a communist or a Jew was, and I definitely didn't know what the word docile meant. <laughs> but it was the first time in my life that I felt like somebody was paying attention to me, and I wanted to belong. And in fact, most people that I've worked with to, to disengage from hate groups, They'll all answer the same thing when I ask them why did they join? Because they wanted to belong. They were marginalized, and that was the group that brought them in. Yeah, I, I interviewed Megan Phelps Roper, and she said a similar, and you're friends with her. She's right? a friend of mine, she's great. Um, I remember her saying in that interview, like, uh, these aren't bad people, they're people who in a vulnerable time in their lives were swayed by bad ideas. That's true, and I think that that's the secret. The secret to, to stopping people from becoming extremists is to understand that in most cases, they're not monsters. They're broken human beings who are doing monstrous things. What, what is the process? How do you do that? How do you lure people away from extremism? Well, I don't tell them that they're wrong. Uh, I don't argue with them. I don't debate them. Instead, I listen. And I listen for those potholes. You know, what is it that's, that deviated them down that path? And then I become a pothole filler. I get people job training or life coaching, tattoo removal, mental health counseling, and when I when they start to feel more resilient, when they're more confident about themselves, then they don't have to blame the other anymore. But I don't stop there. I challenge their ideology, uh, and I introduce them to the people that they think that they hate. And the demonization that happens in their head, the prejudice, just starts to crack once they actually meet the people, because they start to humanize, and they start to relate to them. Um, so this is a picture of you in, at Dachau giving a Heil Hitler. How, how did you eventually walk away from, from that, from that life? That guy looks freaked out right there. Just he realizing does. that. So it was 92 when that picture was taken and I was in a band uh, performing in Germany, uh, singing racist music. How I got out uh, was in 95. I opened a record store uh, after having a son, two sons, and getting married at 19. And starting to question, you know, what my priorities were. Was I this hate monger or was I, you know, a father and a husband? Was my community the one that I'd manufactured around me to boost my own ego or was it the one I'd physically given life to? And uh, I started to question these things and then at the record store I started to meet people that I'd kept outside my social circle. Even though I was selling white power music, I also sold punk rock and hip hop and I started to meet blacks and Jews and gay people for the first time in my life and have a meaningful dialogue and I realized, gosh, they're 
more similar to me than I am with these folks who I've surrounded myself with. Okay. I'm always inspired when people are, when people change with new information, they let themselves be changed. Okay, so when you hear uh, the leaders of our nation speaking, what do you hear? You know, people talk about dog whistles, uh, you know, using code words to appeal to, a, you know, a certain base. I hear, I hear a bullhorn. I hear it loud and clear. So many of the things that are coming out of this administration are things that I used to say 30 years ago. Uh, but they're using slightly more palatable words. Uh, instead of saying, you know, the Jew-owned media, now they call it the liberal media. Or instead of calling it the, the global Jewish conspiracy, they call it globalism. With everything that Trump has done, I have to say when he came out on Holocaust Remembrance Day and wouldn't mention Jews, I was uh, shaken a little bit because that was really loud. Yeah. Or equivocating white supremacists to protesters of neo-Nazis. Both uh, sides. Yeah. <sighs> Good people on both sides, right? Isn't Amazing. that what he said? Yeah. Good potential people on both sides. But see, here's the thing with that, Sarah, is... There may have been people there that looked normal, but they've changed. They're not going to be marching with hoods and shaved heads anymore. And there were people there waving flags. But the people who were there, you know, for Confederate monuments, that's bull****. They were not there for free speech. They were not there for Confederate monuments. They only march in areas where they know progressives live. That's why they marched in Berkeley, and that's why they marched in Charlottesville. They want to provoke Nazis or any extremists. They love two things, silence and violence. If we're silent, they grow. They fester. We sweep it under the rug, and then we you know, tell ourselves, oh, wow, I'm surprised that that exists. Rallies like Charlottesville have been happening for decades, every month across you know, the United States. And I hate to be fatalistic, but they also love violence, because when we are aggressive against them in a violent way, they use it as a victim narrative, and they use that to recruit. And they say, you see, we're not the, the haters. We're the ones who are hated. So do what they did in Boston, and 40,000 people should surround every Nazi rally and show them that we see them, we hold them accountable, but at the same time, you know, we're going to offer them a lifeline. Come on out if you want. Come on out. Join us. Join us. Um, what advice would you give us? Because compassion is what changed me. I challenge your audience. Go out there today, and I challenge you too even though you do this already, find somebody that's undeserving of your compassion and give it to them, because I guarantee you that they're the ones that need it the most. Christian Pugliani, thank you so much. You're so